Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. Uh, we are live, apparently. We're live? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I guess we're live. I, I didn't even hear an intro. We're having a little bit of di- technical difficulties, people. Welcome to the Truth Tonight Talk Radio. I'm your host this evening, Roxy Lopez. And listen, you are going to want to pay attention to everything we're going to talk about on this show this evening. Um, it is phenomenal what is going on. You know, for the past couple, two, three months, I have been getting calls. Uh, UFO sightings, I saw one myself about three nights ago. I have the downloads. I talked about – give you some statistics on how how the whole UFO thing is just coming to this huge uh, transparency. All right. Um, now, I know some of you may be familiar with the National UFO Reporting Center. All right. And um, that's a, a collection of, you know, UFO uh, reports and data of those reports as well as follow up of those reports. And uh, they even have on the front page of their website right now that whenever, and, and I'm quoting them. Whenever we have an unusually heavy influx of reports, our workload is increased to a commensurate degree. Over recent years, we used to consider approximately 300 reports per month to be normal per month, 300. However, over the last 15 months, we have been receiving up to 1,200 reports per month. During the month, reports. So something is uh, really speeding up. And in the news, I don't know how serious we're supposed to take this, but the 25-year-old singer Rihanna pays a UFO watcher for alien updates. She is convinced that extraterrestrial beings exist and pays a sky scanner in the Mojave Desert, California, to give her information on these sightings. Uh, she started using this man who calls himself self a sky scanner to give her information from Nevada or anything that relates to sightings. And uh, I'll pop some of these links into the chat room uh, for you to look over. Uh, if you go to the MUFON website, same kind of traffic going on right now. Uh, the, the reports that are coming out of MUFON right now are just Unbelievable. There's even a report Russia prepares for a close encounter. They even uh, supply the PDF file to read through this from the Kremlin. Um, Reagan uh, to Gorbachev, uh, the threat from ETs would unite Earth. There's a whole documentation on this. What is going on is what I want to know. And, of course, the latest is the Stevensville Lights, a comprehensive radar and witness report study. The PDF is also located on their front page. It just goes goes on and on. And the truth denied, you know, we are getting hammered by guests who are in this field who need a place to go to talk about the latest information. And and let me tell you something, it's ongoing. There are quite a few people that have been on my show in the last couple, two, three months. Daily, daily activity in the skies. This has gone from, you know, a sighting a year for most people or a couple sightings to just massive massive sightings. We're going to ask my guest this evening, uh, who is Wilbur Allen. He's been on the show before. He's an engineer, inventor, and is no stranger to the UFO encounters. An alien encounter in the UK at the uh, the age of five left Wilbur face-to-face with a group of gray ET and a contract photographer at National Geographic. He's a UFO researcher, and he will be Entering and leaving our atmosphere through a wormhole or a stargate. Recent footage he shot shows a sudden manifestation in Sedona, Arizona airspace 
And by the way, he had a lot of witnesses with him, and we're going to talk about who those witnesses were. Uh, in, 2000, in the 2002 incident, a three see an arc or a hole open up in the sky, followed by a flash of light, as he detailed it. I've been getting reports from Mark McCandlish, uh, Jim Kerr, Sean Gotro, and everybody's getting this on film, people. You know, with the ability uh, to have the technology that we do today, and Will has the technology. He's going to explain it to us this evening. We're going to, uh, this is crazy stuff. I want you to know also, I've been asked at least in the last three months to be on about 40, to appear on about 40 different radio shows, some of them AM radio, some of them FM, because of the amount of information that we've been able to put together because of all the guests and the interviews that we've been doing with them. And I want to uh, definitely, uh, Voice Independence uh, contacted me several times out of Seattle. I've been telling people no right now because as you well know, I've been very very busy, but I'm going to have to start saying yes. I'm going to have to start showing up. I'll tell you why. Because this thing is manifesting and it, 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 it is so huge. It is so big, along with the chemtrail issues. See, these are two huge topics for conversation right now that connects everything in the world. Everything in the world. The, the, the suppression of information, the dissemination of, of information, the why we human beings are fighting with one another, our own evolution. I spoke with Wilbur a couple times at length prior to the show, and I don't think the government can keep a lid on UFOs anymore. I'll tell you that much. I just don't think it's possible. Not with over uh, – just shipped out in the first quarter, the first quarter of 2013, over 417 million iPhones with cameras. Sorry, there's just, there's just too much evidence out there to support that, that ETs – are here. You know, you've got James Gilliland doing a documentary. You've got Jose Escamilla doing an, another documentary. You've got Art Bell coming back, EA, to the airways over there at XM, all right, uh, to talk about UFOs. He does not feel that the reporting that's going on at Coast to Coast is accurate. He, he feels like there's, a, there's a, a brick in the road there. He wants to bring back uh, the real conversations about UFOs, so something is definitely uh, going on. Now, um, I'm getting some messages. Hold on just a moment. Um, I'm cutting in and out every couple of seconds. Uh, producer is black online, was frozen up from travesty, jacking it around. I don't know what that means. I guess they're talking about Steve Travesty. Are we good now, gentlemen? Can you uh, tell you're me? you're blacking out, uh, blanking out every couple or a couple of seconds. Every, every minute, other you sentence wanna, you blank right. out. Yeah. So you you might want to drop and reconnect. All right, I'm going to drop the call and and can you can you drop it and reconnect me, Thomas? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, how are we doing now? Am I still cutting out? Well, you'll have to talk a minute or two before we know. Okay, so I don't know what anybody heard. Do I need to repeat everything? No, ma'am. It came all through. It was just it. Had, Buff for a couple of seconds. Should okay. be fine now. Okay, should be fine. Sorry to the listeners. And you see, every time I do a show like this, you all know, um, I don't know, we've got people fooling around in the background, hacking, whatever they're doing. So let's just hope that we can stay on the line. Stay with me, you listeners. Chat room, uh, any questions that you have for the show, please uh, chime in. Uh, again, my guest this evening... I find him to be rolling. We are cooking with gasoline tonight. I'll tell you that much. Wilbur, what's going on in the world of UFOs? Uh, it's going very interestingly because on a nightly basis I'm getting objects that are not consistent with anything I'm sure we have in the air in terms of aircraft. Um, uh, I mentioned to you earlier, I, I live seven blocks from the White House, and the White House's opinion is that there is no extraterrestrial activity taking place, but that is indeed the case. Okay, hold on just a moment. Uh, Will, I just heard your last four words. Producer says we're not doing good. Uh, Thomas, can you hop on the air and tell us what we need to do? Because I, uh, I don't know if the audience is hearing any of this. Yeah, well, or you're, you're the one cutting out. He's not. Uh, okay, and I, I can't hear. Is, I can't hear yeah, Wilbur. I, what I could do is go ahead and cut cut the whole call and restart the whole call. Let's go ahead. By, let's second. do this by telephone, actually. Do, but we're still going to have to go to the Skype server. 
Oh shit! Okay. Well, it's yeah. it's not it's on your end, Roxy. Whatever it is. Uh, well, and and this doesn't happen where I'm cutting out every two seconds. There's nothing nothing on my end I can fix. I can call you. You want to call me on the phone? I can. Why don't we do that? All right. Let me get your number. All right, folks. We're trying to take care of this. Sorry about this. This you know y'all know how this happens sometimes with Skype. And uh, sometimes Roxy's uh, Skype does this, so we will have her back in just a minute. Hello? Is this Roxy? It is. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, Wilbur, can you hear me? I can hear you. That's great. Okay, and if we need to dump you off of Skype and get you on a phone, we'll do that too. Not I don't know what here. the audience has heard. Wilbur, let's just let's start a go. If they didn't hear all the rest of what we were talking about, we'll just introduce that topic later on. But Wilbur, um, you know, I find you to be a very credible person. I've spent many hours on the phone with you uh, several times, and of course, I gave the statistics on um, you know just some of the UFO sightings that are being, those are just the ones being reported. Um, they had a cover up story here in Arizona a few days ago. I saw the craft. I took pictures of the craft. It was huge. And the news came out with a debunking story immediately to say that it was just a weather balloon. So I personally, Wilbur, do not believe that at this point the government's going to be able to keep a lid on UFO activity, as well as ETs, are, are have arrived long ago. So, what's your take on that? With your experience, especially uh, during 2012, you had some really crazy experiences associated with filming some. I believe they are w- wormholes. Uh, I, I would have to say that would be an. Uh an accurate description of that which I documented in Area 51, Groom Lake, uh, while filming for Big Redneck Vacation, which is a country music television program. And what's interesting is that um, while I was in the desert, I was with a few people. Some of those people are on the air, uh, Iran McCauley and Riley Martin, which are with the Howard Stern Show. And they were with me when I was out in the desert. And when I, when I came back, they noticed that I was a completely different person. That's because... In the desert, what I photographed communicated with me telepathically, and it told me to leave. So quite naturally, it was unnerving, to say the least, to look at the photographs that I got and to to know that this object had uh, instructed me to leave, and and it's now following me, and it's imaged over my house nightly. And you mentioned that on on another interview that we did with you. Can you explain that a little bit more uh, in detail as to why you feel... Um, these cra- this craft or whatever it is um, followed you back to D.C. Now, give everybody a little feel for where you live in proximity uh, to the White House, et cetera, and some of the documentation that you've supplied the White House as well. I, I live seven blocks from the White House, and in, in reality, I'm in White House airspace. And the White House's opinion is that there is no extraterrestrial activity and no no actual documentation of extraterrestrial visitations to Earth. And, you know, they're adamant about that information and detail. And the fact of the matter is, in reality, that on a nightly basis, seven blocks from the White House, I'm getting airborne activity that's consistent with the anomalies that I photographed in Groom Lake during the, the filming of Big Redneck Vacation. Right. And how do you feel about that? I mean, what's your response to that? Do you really think, Wilbur, that the White House doesn't have a clue of the nightly activity over um, their skies and your uh, skies, which you know, is right I can't down the street? That. Or do you think they're covering it up? I think I think there's there's it's got to be it's got to be a, a level of information that's that's being concealed here because just by the fact that um, I'm able to 
from a standard position, which is, like I said, seven blocks from the White House, and I'm shooting 90 degrees straight up into the sky, which means I'm shooting straight up to see what exactly happens above the airspace in my home. And on a nightly basis, I'm getting consistent objects. And objects that, uh, again, if you, if you go to my website, ufodc.com, and you go to Area 51, which is at the bottom of the page, and please excuse me if it takes a minute to load because there's a lot of information there. But starting from Area 51 uh, to Sedona to Shreveport and to D.C., which is uh, 10 months of, of information, it's all consistently the same. How do I right. explain images from Area 51, images from Sedona, Arizona, images from Shreveport, Louisiana, and images from Washington, D.C., which are all 100% the same on a nightly basis. And there's no coincidence in that. Absolutely not. And, you know, it's all about physical documentation here, and I'm using the kind of technology that enables me to absolutely document those conditions, even in absolute darkness. And the D4 Nikon has the ability to photograph in absolute darkness, which generates essentially what's called full-color night vision. And I'm generating these samples, and then the samples which I'm filming at a shutter speed, for example, of 1 20th of a second, 1 30th of a second, 1 40th of a second, all the way up to 1 160th of a second at night, and getting objects which are uh, inconsistent with um, what one would perceive as this conventional aircraft, you know, one tends to question the um, credibility of those which put the information out there, especially in the White House, to say that this activity does not exist. And, and who would you believe? The samples that I get seven blocks from the White House or what the White House says? Right. And I, I uh, by the way, thanks for mentioning your website uh, with all the commotion. I, I'd like everybody who's listening to the show to go to www.ufodc.com. Dot com, and I want you to take a look at what we're talking about here because we're referencing some information and we want you to be able to look at it and I hope we don't crash the sites because, um, Wilbur, you were on uh, one of my favorite hosts, uh, uh, Wells. <laughs> I love Johnny B. Wells. And uh, you did Johnny a fabulous B. interview. What's that? Yeah, Johnny B. Yay! Um, but uh, Johnny did such a great interview with you, um, really got a lot of information uh, out to the public in all the right ways, I must say, so kudos to him. Um, but it, 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 it uh, knocked your server off its legs. And uh, not only that, because I've interviewed you a few times, uh, you, it, it, it temporarily disabled my, my website as well. And our traffic was uh, three or four days of just incredible traffic, and the analytics showed that most of the people that were coming to the site were going to see anything that you had done with us. Uh, tell us what happened to your site, because it was just phenomenal. Uh, for about nine days, it was completely knocked offline, and um, from what was described to me by my web server uh, people, that it was a tsunami of hits, and the tsunami of hits essentially melted down the server. So I had to modify my website and move up to another server, and even now it's being pounded. But nevertheless, the data is there, and specifically the fact that here I'm documenting objects with consistency. And, you know, it's difficult to mention to an individual when they look at the website and they notice here's a picture, and they notice the picture continues down the page, and it looks like it's the same photograph, but those are different nights. And it's the same object on different nights, and it all started from Groom Lake Area 51, the same object. And I've got samples of it in Sedona coming out of nowhere and materializing and flying through the video. And then it comes back two hours later and dematerializes in the video the same way it appeared. So without a doubt, I've got physical documentation on how these objects are able to enter into our airspace undetected. And, you know, in some reports when they do notice these UFOs appear, especially during the um, when they're on radar at the air traffic controller areas where they show up, and the air traffic controllers would indicate that these objects would just suddenly appear on the radar scope, fly a while, and then suddenly disappear. Well, I documented how that exactly happens uh, in Sedona. And it was even creepier that whatever it was instructed me to set my camera up to do the video that documented its appearance. 
But, and we'll talk about that when we get back from the break. You know, I want to bring up something else to, to everyone that's listening and future listeners. Um, you know, I did speak with uh, Eron McCulley, who is, uh, does the show, the Riley Martin Show with Howard Stern. And uh, I spoke with him today via you. You know, you wanted me to give him a call, and so we spoke briefly. But we're going to do another interview, Wilbur, with him because Absolutely. he was with you during yes, that he was. shoot. Yes, he was. And um, he he he's going to give his account of what happened and observation as well. Um, it's what happened. Now we were going to have him today, and um, I just uh, when I saw when I spoke to Macaulay, he said, "Let's do another interview. Let's do it all together. Let's do it right." So he didn't want to just pop on for ten minutes. So uh, I can I can agree to that. Uh, while we're at it, uh, Wilbur, you know, for future shows, and then we'll move on here to the break. Uh, for future shows, what we'll do is uh, with you is we're going to get some other individuals that are on with these shoots beyond Macaulay, and we're also working towards, and if Macaulay's listening right now, we are working towards getting on the Howard Stern show. So that's something in the future I think it's completely possible, and I think we should make that happen. What do you think, Wilbur? Absolutely, absolutely, because, you know, they're touching on it, but it's it's still at this level where most people are still not believing that the physical data that's out there and, and this kind of information is definitely needed. Yeah, it's a yes. big picture, yes. you know, and I understand that, um, you know, there are some things going on in the world right now, the war game, let's call it, you know, and all this uh, stuff going on in Syria. And by the way, I want to apologize to Stu Webb uh, and Lorian Fenton. I, I, I am not able to discuss Syria on this show tonight because we're really focused on, on the UFOs. And thank you for inviting me to have that conversation. I'm not able to do it. But I will say this, that Wilbur... This is this is the top of the pyramid, don't you think? I mean, if this gets, if we begin to self reconstruct, deconstruct, whatever you want to call it, and come to realize that we have extraterrestrial beings in our presence, and that UFOs and our uh, how many species that have been visiting us for quite some time, uh, don't you think that that would just push us as a humankind? forward, we could finally evolve and get on with our lives, don't you think? Well, that's what's supposed to be happening, especially if you look at the movies that are being generated by the motion picture companies, and we're all being indoctrinated to that level of activity. So I would assume that that is indeed what's expected to be the next level of activity that we as human beings are expected to experience. Right, I, I can dig it. And um, and as far as you know, I want to when we uh, we've got a break coming up here any second. I it's right right around the corner, so I don't want to get any long stories with you, Bill Wilbur. But a couple of things I definitely want to cover with you is the idea. Um, we'll get. I want to talk about that Sedona night again, where you had that experience with the dogs barking and everything. When Absolutely. we get back. Because Absolutely. that is so, I, I want listeners to understand because we've got so many people calling in with UFO reports and they may make a connection to what happened to you because there's an energy that happens, isn't there, when these things are around? Um, you know, it's interesting that, it, 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 at least for me, that it's almost a command that I'm set up to do whatever they ask me to do because... During that night in Sedona, and we don't want to keep this story going because we got a, your, your break coming up, but it was essentially the same as Area 51 where the object told me to leave. Well, this object told me to set up, and I, I did. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Do you think they're communicating telepathically? I mean, that's what it sounds like. It is telepathic communication. It is absolutely, without a doubt. I think. I think that's consistent with, with, with sightings, for sure. Um, and, hey, that was a nice, quick, short one, Wilbur. So what caught me uh, about the Sedona story is, um, you know, you guys were hired to go out there, et cetera. Um, talk to us about the night that you set up some cameras. Tell us what, the, what where you were in Sedona, um, uh, how far away you were, let's say, from homes or residential areas, and what the night was like, how late it was, what the sky looked like, and and then describe to us what happened 
when you eventually ended up packing up your gear and literally running for your life? Uh, it was the most, most unusual night. And I stayed in the Sedona Riel, and, and I've got to tell you, if you go to Sedona, that hotel, its courtyard is absolutely creepy. That's where I documented the object come out the wormhole. But um, I had the uh, free moment to uh, take the time to uh, just take a little exploratory hike uh, from the hotel, and I decided to go up a very dark, unlit road. And um, I walked about a mile and a half, maybe two miles up the road, which was a, a residential area, which had some very, very nice mansion-like homes there, and set up my camera. And um, as I started walking, I went into a clearance, I set my camera up and started shooting the stars, which was an absolutely extraordinary night. You could see everything in the sky. And as I started the camera firing, um, within five minutes of, of the film starting to, to roll from the camera's programming, all the dogs and coyotes in the area started howling. And as I, as I noticed all of this, it was, it was creepy in a sense that I never heard dogs coming from a 360-degree radius howling like that. They were all around me howling. And it was just un, unnerving. But um, as I... As I Notice these dogs howling. There was an object, which, and I'll, I'll use Star Trek terms, it dropped out of warp. And as it dropped out of warp above my head, it was completely enshrouded in cloud matter, which normally, is, if that was indeed an aircraft, and contrails are associated to aircraft propulsion, which is their, their jet fuel vapors, exhaust vapors, which are generated from the jet uh, engines as they are traveling through a colder level of, of uh, air, which is in higher altitude, it leaves this trail. But this object was completely enshrouded in the contrail, which indicated that it was um, uh, coming from essentially a completely different um, area, so to speak, where, for example, if something would appear in the sky and, and, and then like a meteor, for example, would just appear and fly through the frame, this wasn't like a meteor at all. It had this cloud matter associated to it, and as it slowed down in the sequence of images and the cloud matter started to dissipate, uh, I could see that there were objects that were forming on this object that were being discharged uh, like an aircraft carrier. They were being discharged as this object was slowing down in flight. Well, what was interesting even more is that when I calculated the area in which this object stopped, it stopped directly over what's called the Bradshaw Ranch, which is uh, Sedona's Area 51. In fact, it is um, maintained in terms of the um, overall security. Is the same security grid that's set up outside of Groom Lake Area 51. Is the same security grid was set up outside the Bradshaw Ranch, which is government property. But this object stopped above the Bradshaw Ranch. And it's absolutely un unnerving in the sense that as as all of this transpired, um, I got the urge to pack my gear up and, and, and leave as quickly as possible. And as I got back to the hotel, I noticed there was a small hole that was drilled into my finger. And it was a core sample that was taken out of my finger, and it took about uh, three months for that, that injury to actually heal. And it was pretty tiny, the hole in your thumb, right? Well, no, it's, it was in my, my forefinger, and uh, on the surface was a small hole, but beneath the small hole was a larger hole, about an eighth of an inch in diameter, and the smaller hole on the surface was maybe a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, so it was a small hole going into a larger hole. And it was um, unusual because it looked like someone had plugged uh, took a plug sample, a core sample, out of my finger. And I can't explain how that happened in the course of packing my gear and running back to the hotel, which was about two miles, and it took me about five minutes to get back to the hotel at the speed I was running. I got back quickly because I didn't want to be out there. It was absolutely creepy. Of course, and I had asked you before, your thumb, I mean, I'm sorry, I keep saying your thumb, I'm sorry, Will, um, your, your forefinger where you had this... Uh, Mark, uh, you you mentioned that it didn't it didn't hurt or anything. You happened to notice it is what it was, but it didn't I, hurt. Did I, I it get did, infected or anything? Did. Why did it stay, take so long to heal? I can't answer why it took so long to heal. Uh, the three months, especially 
especially when you cut your finger, at best, it would take two weeks for a cut to heal. But this took three months. And um, it was unusual in the sense that it was a precision hole that was bored into my finger. And right now, I, I could see a very fine scar there, and it looks like the area is devoid of, of matter because, you know, as, as we heal, it leaves the scar tissue. But, you know, it was interesting um, that whatever that object was, that came out of the sky was also imaged by uh, Gianni, a friend of mine who was an Italian photographer, uh, fashion photographer, um, when we were in Area 51. So were the other photographers out there that captured the same objects that I captured come out of the sky in Sedona, which was also captured by a guy named Wayne Miller in Idaho, showing the exact same things I'm getting from Area 51 in Sedona and Shreveport and Washington, D.C. So it shows that activity is consistent no matter where um, those levels of... Um, incursions take place. Correct. And then, you know, when you were in the hotel room, when you got back to the hotel room, again, you were told uh, telepathically, I imagine, to set up your gear again. And what happened then when you, well, when you this, set this that was, gear up? This, what the, what the ended first, up transpiring? The first time was uh, during the filming of My Big Redneck Vacation for Country Music Television. The second time I went to Sedona, which was in April of this year, was for the BBC Discovery Channel. And we had gone out to various locations. First of all, they set out to uh, show the materials to the experts in the area. To the area, one of them is the individual we talked about earlier. Um, God, I forgot his name. Um, my our friend Jim Delatoso. Jim Delatoso, please excuse me, Jim, if you're listening. Um, and um, they had the samples analyzed by Jim, and of course, um, they filmed the analysis, and, and it was indeed uh, extraordinary to say that it was one of the few situations where they were completely blown away by uh, forensically documented extraterrestrial activity. So it's different at a different level when you come out there when, uh, for example, my whole approach in documenting these objects was to do it in the same manner in which NASA would do it in space. So I looked at what NASA was using in space, and NASA in space is using a D3S Nikon. I upended it and used a D4 Nikon, which is double the capacity in terms of sensitivity of the D3S Nikon, and, and indeed did capture, uh, without a doubt, extreme forensic documentation on how these objects are able to enter into our airspace, materializing, and how they're able to leave our airspace dematerializing. So it is with with undue certainty that this information gets out there that they are here and there is without a doubt in my opinion a base in not only Sedona, Arizona but a base in uh, Area 51 a base in Shreveport and a base in Washington, D.C. And possibly a base, base in Phoenix. in D.C.? Um, I'm not sure because, you know, based on my physical samples, and, and if you look at the website samples, you'll notice all of the objects are flying the same direction. And the, the angular velocity of the samples that I'm documenting are all in the direction of the White House. And, you know, without a doubt, they, the White House is situated between um, a large area of land, which the Washington Monument's there, the Mall is there, the Lincoln Memorial is there, and it's a very large open space, and there's all kinds of areas for objects to land. And based on my physical samples, they may be landing, but they may be landing going into the ground because they have the ability to go through solid matter. And, and indeed, if there would be a base here, it would either be underwater in the river, in the Potomac River, or underground in the subterranean city that exists under Washington, D.C. So that's all quite possible. How can we discern the difference, Wilbur, between uh, a possible porthole, wormhole, uh, craft from another dimension, even uh, coming, trans, you know, teleporting into our airspace? How do we discern the difference between that? and a possible meteor or meteorite. Well, what's you know, the difference? When you look at what's interesting, what I, what I imaged in Sedona, for example, and I got a lot of people who had, had their, their opinion that it was a meteor or meteors coming down, and here's where they're wrong, and I've got to emphasize they're absolutely wrong. For example, when I did that shoot and I documented that material, I used a 20-millimeter lens, and if you know anything about photography, a 20-millimeter lens is a wide-angle lens. That means... 
if there's something there, even if it's large, it looks small for the fact that this camera is covering, the, the lens itself is covering a 90, uh, a 110 degree sweep. So we're looking at a 100 degree, 110 degree wide angle perspective. Now, in the samples that I documented in, in Sedona, we see large objects materialize. And, and I'm looking at this at a frame by frame perspective, not what they see on YouTube. I've got the master footage here. So I look at it frame by frame. And in the frame by tell frame us, analysis. Tell us, Wilbur. Wilbur, yeah, I was yes. just going to ask you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Tell us why it's so important to do it frame by frame. Well, for example, since I shot what's called uh, interbolometer photography, and essentially the way I photograph this object, we're shooting in extreme low light, which means we're shooting under darkness here in Sedona. It's not a well-lit city. Um, I programmed my camera to take an exposure at 1 20th of a second at f2.8 using the ISO of 102,400 ISO, which is extremely high. So that means at 1 20th of a second, for every second that that camera was programmed, it was taking a picture at 1 20th of a second. So for the five hours that I programmed the camera to take photographs, for the period that this object appeared, that in the frames where it appeared, it suddenly appears, it materializes. And here the samples show there would be a clear air, air field with stars and the nebula matter, which you can clear, clearly see in the photographic samples. And then suddenly you see this faint object in one frame, and then the next frame it becomes more solid. In the next frame it becomes more solid. In the next frame it becomes more solid. And finally it's completely materialized, and it's flying with a controlled velocity through the frame. Now, a controlled velocity means that it had some um, change associated to it in terms of it changed its directions as it materialized in the frame. And the photographic evidence indicated that this object was flying in a um, approach vector that would be um, uh, like a landing approach vector, like it was coming out of the sky. It was it was approaching the the Earth from a sixty degree angle. And that if it was a meteor, it would have hit, but it didn't hit. In fact, what it did was it flew through the frame at a controlled velocity. Two hours later, it comes back at the same controlled velocity lights up the treetops, lights up my hotel room with this beautiful, pure white light, and then it dematerializes in the video in the same manner in which it materialized two hours earlier. So if that was indeed a, a, a meteor, how is it I have a meteor materialize, and then how is it I have a meteor dematerialize, all moving at the same velocity? That's impossible, and especially from a 20-millimeter perspective. We're looking at wide angle that means the object was under the cloud coverage, under a very low altitude. I would say possibly three to four hundred feet high in the sky as it flew by. That's not high, and that's based on a twenty millimeter perspective. Yeah, that's odd. And that's odd. The physics are wrong if it if it was a meteor. And, and thanks for explaining that. You know, absolutely, just to verify, absolutely. Yeah, just to verify a couple of things, you know. Um, Mark McCandlish, who's an aviation expert and also was part of the UFO disclosure 11 years ago, what they're seeing in Northern California right now is really odd, too. And he knows it's not meteors. He knows these are wormholes. And he was talking to me about some of the sightings he's seeing, and one of them in particular that appeared to be meteor-like, but then it went off and on and back off and then on and then turned the other way and went back up. And we all know that that can't be a meteor. Well, I have physical documentations that would substantiate that claim. So we know these are not meteors, but there are people who are hell-bent on stopping the flow of information. And there was one guy, he kept calling me dude and doing the LOLs. Dude, LOL, dude, LOL. Well, dude, <laughs> LOL, he was the dumbass because he was absolutely wrong, not looking at the physical data. You know, it's even interesting. They only showed one part of the video. They never showed part two. Part two would uh, put the icing on the cake. But part two is yet to come, and I'm hoping part two we can air on your show. Great, great. Uh, I would love to. I'd be honored. Uh, you know, the other aspect of this, uh, of what you're being able to 
really fine tune. Let, let's uh, journey back to Area 51 for a minute. Uh, when you were out there, and if anyone has ever been out that way, you also know it's a very similar location as far as light goes. There's no city lights. There's no there there's is nothing no out there. Light. Pitch, pitch nothing. black. Pitch, pitch black. black. Pitch black. So you would and, need technology uh, that could go out there and handle that. That's right. That's right. And if somebody is going to go out there, you might want to take a look at how Wilbur films in these areas. But my point is, I, I too have been out to Area 51, and, and that's another creepy uh, type of place, especially when you start seeing sightings. And then, of course, Wackenhut starts driving out towards you to, you know, to the to the main road. It's a little bit creepy. Another, you know, lockdown facility, if you will. You know, you'll be shot if you cross over uh, a certain line there. But you were filming out there, and again, the similar uh, the, the similarities. I mean, it, like you say, it's the exact same stuff you're filming everywhere in Washington D.C., in Sedona and in Area 51. Now, with Area 51's technology, how is it even possible, Wilbur, that Area 51 workers don't see this stuff? Well, see, that's that's not the case, because they do see this stuff. And, you know, it's interesting. I shot thousands of frames in Area 51, and I let the camera fire frame after frame after frame after frame. And I've got hundreds of frames of beautiful stars. But then all of a sudden in those frames, an object would appear and fly through at a controlled velocity. Now, when you think about it, meteors are not a controlled velocity because what happens is as they enter into the Earth's atmosphere, they start to slow down. As they slow down, they're breaking apart, and it leaves this, this matter, which you can clearly see if it is a large meteor that shows that it's breaking apart. Well, these objects don't break apart. What they do is they materialize and they fly through. It all started in Area 51. And now the same events are taking place no matter where I go. And the same objects are telling me to photograph these events. And I do. And look at the samples that I get on a nightly basis, seven blocks from the White House. Yeah, the the uh, the ones that you sent me that are up on the, uh, the our website, the truth tonight dot com, those are stunning. I, I I I can't say anything more about it. Again, if you understand photography, it's pitch black out there. So to capture what you've captured in a millisecond is amazing. Because the other question I have for you is, if you were just standing out by the side of the road in Area Fifty One. Would you see any of these objects with the naked eye? Well, you know, I didn't, but it, it didn't develop into that because whatever it was saw me and it instructed me to leave. And that's where I packed my gear and I complied immediately. But what was even more abstract is when I went into the desert, I went into the desert open-minded and just set to just get a couple of pictures and, you know, do what I had to do to document the fact that I was indeed in Area 51. But it turned out to be a little bit more than that because whatever it was communicated with me telepathically and followed me. It started following me. As, as we left the perimeter of Area 51 and went back to the staging area in Rachel, Nevada, which was 25 miles away, I set up my camera in the desert there and I have this object at a much lower altitude slithering towards me like a snake. And it was interesting in the samples that I got at Groom Lake that whatever it was, whatever they were in the sky above my head, they had characteristics that were similar to a snake as they flew, and they were luminous white. And there was another person that I had uh, spoken to in Sedona that witnessed in the same area of Area 51 these what she called sperm cells. And, and that's what, indeed, these objects looked like, and, and now they're following me. And uh, I was talking with you a couple of nights ago, and uh, on the roof of your home, you have a camera set up nightly. I believe you said for the last roughly eight months, nightly. Ten months um, now. How many photos are being shot nightly uh, that on your roof? When I, when I set up the camera and it does a six-hour stream, it takes 40,000 images in six hours. So okay. I go through all 40,000 frames. Okay, I understood. And out of the 40,000 frames nightly, how many objects are appearing in those 40,000 frames? 
if, if you look at the fact that what I'm talking about in terms of physical documentation, where we talk about multiple documents in terms of like that sample you sent me, if you'd showed me the frame before and the frame after and the frame after and the frame after, then we could conclude based on the multiple frames. Well, I'm getting yeah. samples. Some of the samples have up to 60, 70 frames associated to the same object. So we're able to show that, for example, the way I program this technology, and one of the things that was questionable based on the comments posted on my YouTube channel was that people were making these comments about how, uh, for example, you're seeing time-lapse photography that, in, in, and indeed in some cases using time-lapse photography, especially with the type of technology that's conventionally used, that it would require a longer exposure to do what I'm doing with uh, exposures at a 60th of a second. And, you know, certain people would do with the kind of cameras that they have, it, it would take them a half a second, one second, two second to get the same photograph. And in the two second photograph, you would see there was etching associated to it because in the long term exposure, you could see that everything is moving. And therefore, that whatever object you're photographing, if it is photographed in a one half second exposure, that you can conclude that based on the duration of the exposure that what you photographed is a streak that's associated to the object because if the object is moving faster than one half of a second you would see the object in its luminosity as it flies through that exposure but at a sixtieth of a second that's not the case what we see is the actual object without blurring associated to it and with the multiple documentation that i'm able to get i'm able to see that without a doubt that there's propulsion associated to these objects and that they do indeed suddenly appear and disappear at will yeah, I'm looking right now at ufodc.com if anybody wants to join me. And I'm looking at the uh, profound photo called Orange Propulsion Contrail. And I see what you're saying. I see what you're talking about. You know, if you want to follow along people so that you can understand and see the visual of what Wilbur is explaining, just go to ufodc.com and you can just follow along. Now, uh, now, I find it... Uh, go ahead. Now, let me get specific with that one sample, too, and all the samples that sure. are on the page. With the objects, a, a conventional aircraft, all have 40 to 50 frames of the conventional air aircraft as it flies through the frame. On these samples, it is only one frame. That indicates that they're moving at a much higher velocity than the conventional aircraft, also at the same altitude as a conventional aircraft. But based on the samples, conventional aircraft are maybe one-third the size of the objects I'm photographing, maybe a, less than that, an eighth the size of the objects. And that would be a good question. Did uh, Jim Delatoso, and for those of you who do not know who Jim Delatoso is, for the, probably the last, I'd say, 30-something years, Jim Delatoso has um, massive software, and he basically uh, ran uh, for years uh, every one that had a UFO sighting that had a photo. Uh, he would just go through these photos and check for their validity, uh, see if they were a hoax, and then he'd start taking layers off of these and bringing them in closer and getting a better look at them and so forth. And, and Jim is a friend of mine as well, and I, uh, I, I've appreciated him over the years uh, for his abilities. He's just an amazing man when it comes to taking a look at this stuff. And he took a look at all of your stuff. He went over it with a fine-tooth comb. That's what he does. That's his job. That's what, and he, that's what he loves not to do. Debunk it. And, he, and, he and what did he say? Not, and he, he did not debunk not, one thing, did he? Not one. Not one. In fact, I mean, I do know that in his... Yes, he did. He confirmed the data. And for those of you out there who don't know the difference between confirmation of data and iffy, uh, when Jim cannot tell what an object is, when Jim goes over it with a fine-tooth comb for many days sometimes, going through all these different programs that he uses, he will actually say uncertain. He'll answer uncertain. Uncertain as to what the object is. What did he say about your stuff? Well, again, it's uncertain because, of course, unless you're extraterrestrial, you can't tell me what I'm photographing. But he did indeed, <laughs> based, based on the, the physical data, and, and here here's a person that deals with, Metadata, and metadata is the digital impression that's put onto a sample from the camera. And, and there was an individual on YouTube that was talking about this freeware that can allow you to manipulate the metadata. I'm not a hacker, so I'm not trying to hack my data to make it look like it's real. I don't need to do that because it is real. 
But for those people that need to hack their data to prove the validity of something, that does tend to make things look shady for us who do have credible samples. But the metadata in the sample that I submitted to uh, Jim indicated without a doubt that there was no modification, no augmentation, no man manipulation at all associated to the samples. And I showed him frame after frame of this object as it dropped out of warp and stopped above the Bradshaw Ranch. And that he did indeed confirm uh, based on his analysis when we filmed for my BBC Discovery UFO special that's about to air here in the United States. Hey, and welcome back, and uh, just want to give you a little brief update at Revolution Radio. You know, we are growing in uh, fabulous numbers with listeners, and we are listener-supported as well. We want to thank all the listeners for your contributions and helping us to grow into the largest Internet radio station out there. Uh, it's absolutely fabulous, over 50 hosts with nonstop reporting of uh, the freedom of speech, uh, the ability to have shows like the one we're having this evening, to be able to... Uh, talk about what's really going on in the world no matter what the topic is so kudos to the listeners uh, for continuing to donate and if indeed you want to check out the archives on Revolution Radio simply go to freedomslips.com and hit the archives and for a very small donation on your part you can have access to hundreds of shows a day so thanks a lot for your support we really appreciate it again Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Wilbur, I have a question for you in relationship to the work that you do. I can't help but think that because of uh, your childhood um, that you were contacted by ETs, but it's possible that this is your life's purpose. Have you struggled with that at all? Uh, that is indeed the case, and I've, I've just come to that realization that um, that is what they uh, indoctrinated me into. And it was interesting that, you know, that most people who would encounter something like this would, would normally react totally differently in, in the sense that they would not want to have to deal with this at all. They would try to go somewhere and, and cover their heads in some sand and not try to deal with the matter at all. But I, on the other hand, would... Uh, choose to stand there and observe it and try to photograph it and in fact try to get on board if I could to, to see what indeed I was photographing in terms of uh, its reality. I think that's my next step. My next step is to go on board one of these objects. Is that right? Now, do you, you know, let's go back to Sedona for a second, you know, the creepiness of the feeling that surrounded you when the dog started barking and you know, time to pack up and get the heck out of here. Um, are there good ETs and bad ETs? I mean, do you know? Can you feel that? Do you, is is there a difference, do you think? Well, you know, um, for example, what I encountered in Area 51 when the object telepathically told me to leave, initially initially that frightened me, and, and, and that's, that's why I wanted to bring Iran on this, because... Iran knew me, and, and he knew that when I went into the desert, I had a completely different personality than I did when I came out of the desert. And, and my motivation coming out the desert was, and I had to tell them in the band, we need to get out of here immediately. And that's what I kept emphasizing, we need to get out of here immediately. But even though that was my reaction, indeed, what this object was doing was it was warning me about what was about to happen and what did indeed happen was there was an influx of security personnel from area 51 that ascended upon us and we had to leave the area quickly in fact a bbc crew was arrested during the time that we were out there and what the bbc crew saw while they were face down in the dirt with m16s pointed towards their heads were the objects that were slithering in the sky above their heads that i photographed so without a doubt, these objects wanted me to photograph them. They wanted me to get out of there so I wouldn't have been subjected to the security personnel at Area 51, which, by the way, would have confiscated my camera. And with that data, we would have had no documentation of all of, of what indeed transpired during the filming of what was supposed to be a, a comedy, My Big Redneck Vacation for Country Music Television, which is hosted by Tom Arnold. Right. And you would have had nothing. Nothing. From that shoot. Yeah. I, and not. and I do. So maybe the creepiness that you experienced was the same creepiness that I and a couple of people when I went out there in 1990 experienced. It wasn't the crafts in the sky that were bothering me. I mean, that was, 
you know, that was a big deal to even find out in 1990 that Area 51 really was there because it was so urban myth, you know, and conspiratorial. So to find out that it was really there was sort of like, whoa, to begin with. I mean, these days, we, you know, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. But back then, it was still sort of a, a mystery, you know, and uh, they did such a great cover-up on that. Most people that didn't believe that Area 51 even uh, existed. But what did creep me out was the several whack and hut jeeps that started to exit Area 51 coming towards the main highway and then, you know, about 10 feet away from us just parking and turning off their lights and before we knew it, we were surrounded. That is pretty creepy feeling. So uh, I can relate to getting a feeling to pack up and go as you did because there was more to come and more to come was arrests or, you know, the confiscation of your camera and all, all well, your yeah, stuff these, impossible. These, these aliens were, were problem, saving you know? me. They, they essentially saved yeah. me from that. Sounds and, like you it. know, what was even more bizarre was when we left the area, the staging area, we set up camp was in Rachel, which is 25 miles from the perimeter of Area 51. And in the desert there, when I set my camera up, I imaged, which, again, was a no-fly air zone, airspace, rather, this luminous object, which was slithering like a snake coming towards me and then it veered off in the samples and flew a um, like a 90 degree did a 90 degree 90 degree turn away from the point of view of the camera even more bizarre is after i left the staging area and went back to my hotel which was a cowboy stream which is a beautiful place to go to if you're ever in that area and that hotel is awesome it showed up on video on command i set my camera up in the courtyard of the hotel and said Okay, show yourself. And within 10 seconds of saying it, this object appears on video. So without a doubt, I knew I was being monitored at that point. Um, and, and it's now um, 10 months after the fact. And here I'm getting the same objects over my home, which is seven blocks from the White House on a nightly basis. The same objects from Area 51. Man, I mean, they've got to know something's going on. And and, and here, here's the clincher. Um, they've got to know. Here's the clincher, though. Why now? Why are these craft showing up by probably the millions? Because people all over the world, you and I have talked about this before, all over the world, are reporting sightings and something very interesting that's happened in association to big protests and it's all documented in Brazil, in in Egypt, in Turkey. UFOs are showing up at these protests and as these millions, you know, in some cases in Egypt, millions of people out in the street, they're photographing these um, these objects that are coming down. Um, what do you think the relationship at this point with the massive sightings have to do with uh, protests or where we're at on the planet? Is something coming? In other words, are we in for like a world war or something dangerous? We're at the cliff of something dangerous and they know it and they're possibly coming to intervene? Is that possible? It's a possibility, but, you know, I, I, I couldn't... I can't form an opinion on that because I, I don't have that information, so to speak. But in, in lieu of things, what's even more interesting is, and we have to bring this into perspective also, is the Mayan calendar and that how all of a sudden at the end of the Mayan calendar, there is an influx of UFO activity. When I had the close encounter at the U.S. Capitol building July 16th in 2002, one of the things that was abstract that night was the fact that I saw what looked appeared to me to be a group of ancient Mayans walking through uh, in front of the Washington um, reflection pool by the U.S. Capitol building. To me, that was abstract because these people were dressed like ancient Mayans, and they were completely out of place. But yet, in the entire event that night, when the green objects parked above my head and then left in the wormhole, it clearly, without a doubt, indicated at that point, especially in 2002, that whatever these objects were, which were also imaged in space by Apollo 7 and Apollo 11, that they're now here on Earth. Let's talk about that for a minute, uh, Apollo 7 and 11. Um, what's the evidence there as far as what was the footage uh, and what if, those if, astronauts if, if, actually saw? If you, if you go to my website, it's definitely the next 
chapter below Area 51, and it, it starts with um, Dr. Buzz Aldrin, who was the uh, one of the uh, flight personnel on Apollo 11. And at that time, uh, Buzz and Neil Armstrong uh, filmed from the command module using a 16-millimeter motion picture camera that was provided by NASA at the time during space flights. They didn't have video technology like that. But they used a 16-millimeter motion picture camera to document this uh, green, luminous green, fluorescent green anomaly, which flowed like liquid uh, outside the command module. And there were two objects that were in formation. And the footage that was filmed by Neil Armstrong during that encounter was a 100% match to the anomalies I photographed stationary above my head at the U.S. Capitol building July 16th in 2002. So we're able to connect with physical samples, and again, I'm dealing strictly with photographic evidence. That photographic evidence from NASA JPL Apollo 7, photographic evidence from NASA JPL Apollo 11, photographic evidence from NASA JPL shuttle missions, STS X-ray satellite, showed without a doubt in 1990 in space that these luminous green objects were there. And that my close encounter in 2002 indicated that these luminous objects, which NASA was familiar with starting in 1967, have now infiltrated our airspace and parked above the U.S. Capitol building. And 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 so you don't subscribe to anything that you hear on the streets. Then is what you're saying. You don't you don't pick up uh, other urban myths and go with them and what have you. What you're saying is if you can't prove you're ever, you you are a it's not very scientific about it, I guess. If you can't prove it's, it's it, it's purely really about forensics. If, if, if the physical data does not exist, okay. I'm not going to put myself out there. And 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 I'm dealing with other individuals. For example, like a photographer named Melvin Harris in upstate New York. Melvin photographed a luminous orange sphere July the fourth in 2008. That same luminous orange sphere landed in front of me August the 3rd in 2008 in Baltimore, Maryland. And we have a 100% match. So with 100% match, how do you then try to say to me that, oh, that's a lens flare, or oh, that's this and that. And generally, those people that make those statements couldn't possibly program a VCR, and VCRs went out of business 20 years ago. They're going to sit there and tell me what I photographed. But the physical data is without a doubt indicative to the fact it indicates that these objects do indeed exist and they are a 100 percent reality and and let's talk about lens flares is there a way to discern uh, via a software that something is a lens flare as opposed to an actual object or a wormhole well 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 for example the sample that was disputed by many to be lens flares, and I have to explain to you how these people who disputed the fact were absolutely wrong again, is that when I photographed the object from Lower Senate Park at the U.S. Capitol building July 16th in 2002, and Robert Stanley, who does my research for me, will confirm that with his research also. You need to look at Robert Stanley's material at Unicus Magazine that whatever this object was that I documented, um, it was uh, without a doubt um, telling me to do so as all the other objects did. And what I have to, to, to confirm with the information that's supplied by NASA is that we have physical samples. And when you do a comparative analysis, when you take a sample, say samples taken from Betty and Barney Hill, and Betty Hill samples are a match to the objects I photographed at the U.S. Capitol building, and the samples that Kathy Martin gave me since Kathy was her niece were, in fact, the same objects that I photographed at the U.S. Capitol. But during the time Betty Hill provided her materials to be analyzed, they concluded that those were processing errors that were generated by the film lab. So when they had nothing to do a comparative analysis to, then therefore they would conclude an error that these are not UFOs. But you see, we do have UFOs, and the UFOs, unidentified flying objects, are objects that are clearly, without a doubt, unidentified. And an unidentified object suddenly appears, and it is in a level of technology that's way beyond the technology that we have right now. How can you conclude that that is a lens flare. And by the way, lens flares work like this. In the U.S. Capitol building, when I photograph the green objects in the sky, they're running north and south. The street lights are running east and west. 
lens flares in the case of that situation in that photograph would also be running east and west because they would be an equal opposite to that which is on the ground and you see there's no lens flares in the sky the objects in the sky are running north and south not east and west so it's an impossibility for the objects that I photographed at the US Capitol building to be associated to lens flares and a lot of people they want it to be that because that's what they're indoctrinated to believe but they're absolutely wrong and the physics just does not apply and, and I can again bring in Dr. Bruce McAbee who is my associate and have him confer the fact that without a doubt that what I photographed was not a lens flare well, I think at some future date we'll we'll get Bruce as well to explain, um, you know, in more detail uh, what what you're also conveying, and so that the listeners can really dial in yet another level of education with this. And I appreciate that. You know, you've submitted, have you not, the information at some point to the White House to let them know there's activity going on? I know I brought this up before. What has the White House responded to you? if anything at all? Absolutely nothing. What does the only, that only, say the only, the only, only people that did respond, and, 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 and you know, I've got to say, it's, it's, it's very interesting, and I have some very, very interesting friends. John Podesta. John Podesta was the chief of staff during the Clinton administration. John Podesta and the Center for American Progress are the only ones that express interest in my research and it's even more interesting that here I document an alien landing on the US Capitol building July 16th in 2002 and nobody knows a thing about it July 16th 1952 the exact same thing happens and even then individuals are trying to say oh those are lens flares but yet they can't explain how lens flares can move through the frame with controlled motion and yet the lights on the ground didn't move but the objects in the sky did so if the objects in the sky are moving how can those therefore be lens flares people come up with the most insane i'll use the term retarded retarded things that are just <laughs> absolutely mindless and and i see those mindless comments on my youtube channel and those people that claim oh those meteors they're absolutely retarded they didn't look at the data at all i i i think that part of that is, and I experienced the same thing, Will, um, part of that is if you don't do the work yourself, you don't go out and buy the camera, set up the tripod, tripod, start start doing the work to understand the camera and what you're getting and what you're seeing, etc. Once you experience that, now you can talk about the subject matter um, of what you're doing. And I think that it is a complete difference between people who are actually doing the photography themselves, learning what they are looking at, exactly. studying what they are looking at. Until exactly. they actually go that route, there's a disconnect, isn't there? Absolute disconnect. You know, here I'm using a D4 Nikon. I'm using Avid Media Composer 7. I'm using Boris FX BCC 8.2, which is a high-definition noise reduction technology for video and motion picture effects. And it's all purely high-tech, and it's a level of technology that's obviously used by NASA. And they're, they're indeed, they have government contracts which confirm that Avid and Boris FX te technology is used by NASA. And here I'm using NASA-grade technology, and people don't have this level of technology. They're going to tell me what I'm getting a picture of and tell me how I'm getting these photographs, being absolutely clueless how it's done. But yet people want to sit up there and put their fingers in their mouths and put, hold their hands up and say, hey, I got the answer, I got the answer, no matter how wrong it is. And that wrong answer affects a lot of people who are stupid enough to believe it. Yeah, it influences others, understood. Um, Sheeple. I, I get it. I get it. I completely get it. That's why I want to encourage listeners. You know, if you really have a passion for this, if you really want to understand more of the depths of it, you know, on your website, Wilbur, uh, ufodc.com, you describe under pr practically every photo what you're using, your settings, and, and, and all the rest of it. How um, it's done. Not to say that an amateur could just pick up a camera and start, but if you begin the process you at least begin to understand what uh, the forensics are, as you, as you said. And if this you, is a science, isn't it? If you do, as I indicated on the website, your photographs would look exactly the same. I'm not trying to pull is the wool right? over your eyes. Exactly. It's there, it's, this is fact. 
if you do as I say on my website, your 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 images would look exactly the same. I'm not BSing people here. It's all about facts. If you have the technology, you can go out and do this yourself. And I suggest most people do that, but they don't. They rather sit there and say, oh, this is a meteor. Oh, this is uh, anything but the realities of the matter. And, and what disturbs me more, they're going to tell me what I photographed, and they weren't even there at all. So how are you going to tell me what I photographed if you were not there? Are you a psychic? And most people try to be psychics. I, I'm amazed by it. <laughs> It, they're not really psychics. They're stupid, you know? <laughs> well, and I think that it is time the public starts to get involved instead of throwing pot shots, you know, from the peanut gallery, so to speak. Now, listen, with NASA, uh, NASA has been caught red-handed a few times loading up some photos in their galleries that uh, others, astronomers, or uh, have downloaded uh, and found objects in these photos, and then NASA turns around, and this is this is happening like a movie in the last 20 years, where they turn around and they take those photos down. Um, what's with NASA? They have the ability, they have the uh, technology. What's with NASA? Are are they just a uh, a, a, a gate? No, you know, it's, with locked it's, gate to the public. Honestly, it's <laughs> a it's a government job, and you've got government workers there. And you know, sometimes government workers do really great jobs. Sometimes a few slip. You know, they make some mistakes. They'll let something pass. They shouldn't have let pass, but it goes through the, the pipeline anyway. And when they make that mistake. They take that information down. But you see, it's those mistakes that validity, that, that solidify the data that I'm getting. And, and the fact of the matter, without a doubt, NASA is getting the same samples. And in fact, some of the samples that I do have on my website were imaged during all of the Apollo moon missions orbiting the moon. So, you know, they know. And what's happening now is those objects that they encountered in space followed us back, and now they're here. And they're monitoring us as we were monitoring them on the moon. And there were moon bases during the time of the Apollo moon missions that the astronauts were told not to talk about. Alien moon bases. They're there. It's Christmas time down here. What does that mean? Looks like a Christmas tree. Huh? It looks like a Christmas tree. It's lit up like Christmas. What does? That's what the code talk would be when the astronauts would let land oh, on the moon. Oh, gotcha. Sorry, you just lost me there. We took a curveball. I was like, okay, it's Christmas time. What's he talking about? Gotcha. So uh, they also were not allowed to talk about anything. Are any of them talking? Um, well, you know, my associate, Dr. Mitchell, and my associate, Dr. Aldrin, are without a doubt, well, Buzz is not going always out there as, as, as he should, but Edgar, Edgar Mitchell is without a doubt, uh, confirming everything that I photographed. And in fact, I use Dr. Mitchell as the scientific basis to that which I put forth on my website. So without a doubt, here we have at astronauts confirming the validity of that which is on UFODC.com. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, is, which is big stuff. It's just how do you get the point across? Do you think that the government is ever going to reveal? Are they ever going to tell tell at least let out of the bag what they know. Well, they are. They are already confirmed the fact that Area 51 is real, but what they didn't confirm is what's in the air of Area 51. And by the way, when I was there, I wasn't concerned about the base. I was looking at the sky. And what was in the sky was E.T. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's going to happen next, do you think, Wilbur? I mean, they're, they're everywhere now. They're on film more than they've ever been. The reports are, uh, in 2013, more than ever. And as you mentioned, the relative uh, timeline with the Mayan calendar ending and then what you saw in D.C., what's next? I mean, do you have any kind of idea uh, of what's next? Well, next to Jesus Christ coming in the mothership, um, that would probably be the next next level. I mean, what's coming is going to be extraordinary. And when you think about it, when you look at what's written in the Bible, and I'm not really, um, I am a religious person. I was raised a Baptist. And, and, you know, it's interesting that what I read is is an alien encounter. 
when these people can live two to three hundred years and touch something and turn it into wine and and turn things into that and and make oceans spread apart and I mean come on aliens so you probably subscribe as well to the ancient alien theories um they've been here they've been here before um all of the physical samples clearly indicates they've been here they've been here during the caveman days they've been here they're here the same stuff it doesn't change so are we living on their planet it's a very strong possibility we were seeded and that we are an alien experiment that's gone wrong, so to speak. Have we gone just, what, and, and explain that? I've never heard you well, I've never look, heard look, you look, at, look, at, look at what's happening, Fukushima and Japan and, and all of the events that are taking place, the destabilization of countries and governments in the Middle East. Things are going wrong. They're definitely going sideways. Absolutely. Do you think, I mean, I asked you this before, but, it, I mean, you know, possibly, is it possible that that they're here to help? It, 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 you, you found them to be friendly. Um, so is it possible they're here to help? I, I found them to be creepy. Um, I wouldn't say friendly because I don't think it's friendly to poke a hole in your finger and take some meat out. So, I mean... <laughs> I mean, that's that's what you have to look at. No, they, they, could have, they could have taken me instead of a piece of meat. But, you know, when you look at the advancements, that piece of meat could provide a lot of information to them. And it probably did. So, you know, when we think about the overall picture of things, you know, I feel I feel like I'm an experiment because I'm constantly monitored and here without a doubt. Here I've got samples from Area 51 and all the places that I've been for all the productions that I've worked on. And here they all show the same pictures that are over my home. What does that say? It says that without a doubt that we are indeed being visited by extraterrestrials. Without a doubt. If not, their base is here. Okay, and we're back again with Wilbur Allen. I'm testing out. I'm back on the server again because the cell phone was dying. So uh, can you all hear me or am I cutting in and out again? Uh, sounds good here. Sounds good? Okay, great. Excellent. Okay, so let's rock and roll. We got them. Okay, so at least the last half hour. Uh, Wilbur, the the sample that they took uh, from you, and um, have they ever taken a sample from you before? Um, you know, I, I don't know if, if that did happen, but I know periodically that I would wake up and I wouldn't be in my bed, and I'd be somewhere else. Obviously, they would beam me on board this ship of some sort, and they're using transporter technology. And, okay. I mean, it's it's a little different because, you know, I think one of the things that I, I've got to mention, there's a film that was called Taken. It's about children that are visited by aliens. It is factual. It's, it's almost exactly like what I dealt with as a child, except the aliens I saw weren't tall like the ones they used in this film. The ones I saw were little and wore silver spacesuits. It was most abstract. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty scary. And you were about five, I think, when you started having those encounters. Is that, is that correct? It started when I was five. They implanted me with something, and for about 12 years nightly, I vomited. And it was because my body was trying to reject whatever they put inside me. And, um, you know, it was even more interesting is when the vomiting stopped is when everything started to uh, take place around me. And, and I developed this technology, which enabled me to photograph these things that were transpiring around me. And for the longest time, uh, the people that I would tell these events were happening to me, especially in the schools I went to on a military basis as a child, they wouldn't believe me at all. In fact, they separated me from the rest of the children by putting me in special ed. So now for those teachers that put me in special ed, I would like them to see my research and, and to see what their reactions would be. Uh, have you ever thought about maybe doing a study on that, seeing how many people have been uh, approached and uh, by beings? Have ever, I mean, is that of any interest to you to find out if there are more people? Well, you know, basically what we're talking about is alien abduction. And, and then you look at all the movies that are on the market about alien abduction, and most of the people who have these encounters generally have psychological and emotional instabilities associated to them from these events. What happened in my case was it, it didn't develop into psychological or any emotional instability. It turned out to be something that I it would call an, an enrichment process, and it enriched me to um, to the level of technology that I am right now. 
Okay. Uh, bear with me, Wilbur. I might have our producer call me back on the phone again because uh, most of what you're saying is uh, all I'm getting is complete static. A uh, very unusual show we're having here, but just uh, if you, you uh, we may have to do that if this continues, but you know, let, let's see if we can hang on. Um, well, and I'm sorry, Wilbur, because it's really interrupting our, our, our uh, flow here. So it I could be the powers that, that be. It could be the powers that be. You know, we could be actually being monitored. I mean, and and that's how it happens. I mean, I can't I can't discount how or why I can melt a server from just a simple UFO website. You know. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, it, 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 because of the interest, let me tell you something, uh, folks. About oh, I don't know, twenty minutes ago, uh, during the show, I just I posted on Facebook. How many of you have seen a UFO? Uh, there's over 21 comments of people describing, and then now people are actually posting photos of just very recent UFOs. Uh, one was just as recent as last night behind somebody's home in St. John's River. That would be from Annie. Uh, and, um, of course, there's uh, 10 likes, which means, yes, they've seen it. So there's about 40 comments in, in, in the last few minutes of people who just, you know, Yes, several times have seen UFOs. Everybody's uh, saying the same thing. So it's such... I got her to disappear. ...saw or had an alien encounter. Wilbur, what's, what's, what the, what's that? Uh, actually, you know, Roxy, I, I didn't hear what you said, so I don't know how to respond to that. Um, okay, so they're interfering with the show again. I mean, more so than ever. I would like it, uh, Thomas, if you could call me back on the cell phone... Because obviously back on the server, this isn't working, so we're going to have to get back. I don't know it's if you not. can hear me, Wilbur, and I apologize for that. You're breaking but... apart. All right. Uh, Thomas? Okay. Thomas, can you call me back on the cell? Okay. Hello? Roxy? Hello, yes. There you go. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I guess that wasn't working out for us. And now oh, I've got to walk away from the... Didn't. We're okay now, right? We're okay. Okay. So back to the topic. Oh, by the way, can you let us know uh, when that uh, show with Nat Geo is coming out? Do you know? Do you have a date on that? Um, I am absolutely clueless. I know from the amount of Facebook English hits I'm getting from the UK um, that it must be airing in the UK right now. But when that hits, it's going to blow this all apart because it's without a doubt um, factual. And we're dealing specifically with factual data. And the facts of the matter are that we are indeed being visited by aliens. How do those guys that were on the show, how do they feel about it? Were they blown away too? Um, you know, most of them were, and I understand that the crew on, on, on a different occasion, you know, we didn't spend all our time together. I spent most of the time there by myself and doing research by myself. And that some of the samples that I was able to photograph on, on my loan, on my uh, personal time, that the crew indeed photographed themselves. So we have physical documentation to substantiate everything that transpired. But it was kind of weird that during all of the filming I did with the BBC in the Sedona area uh, last April, everything that transpired transpired after filming and transpired at the hotel, the Sedona Real in the courtyard. And that's where the initial encounter in 2012 when I was filming for my big redneck vacation took place. So, you know, it was a uh, confirmation, to say the least, to go back to Sedona and on the second round to have this object tell me to set my camera up and then to have it appear in a video stream without a doubt materializing into Sedona's airspace and flying through the frame and without a doubt flying back into the airspace two hours later and dematerializing as it appeared two hours earlier. So, you know, the physical documentation is there, and it was all done with a 20-millimeter lens. If you can explain to me how I was able to get such a large object with a wide-angle lens, then, you know, I'll confirm the fact that then it was indeed a meteor, but it was no meteor without a doubt. Meteors don't light up treetops, you know? It's impossible. Yeah, I, 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 you sent me a few of the pictures, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, 
I don't think you have them on your site. I'm, I'm not. Oh, I don't they are. They're, they're on in the Sedona. Anymore. They are. They are up there. They're on the Sedona area. It's all they there. They are. They're all in the data. Sedona. All Those the data blew is my there. Mind. I, okay, uh, the ones with the treetops lit up and the whole nine yards. I mean, this whole area is lit up. And yes. you know, no, it's not a helicopter. You know, obviously. No. Um, and and with this little tiny dot, it, yet you see this light coming towards you and just lit, light up the entire area. By the way, when something like that happens, it really blows your mind because it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're talking about an area that was lit up that's bigger than if you had a helicopter light shining down on you. It was you know? intense, pure white light. And, you know, that we don't have that kind of pure white light. I mean, you could tell without a doubt a spotlight, it's white, but there's inconsistencies associated to it because a spotlight has a center beam and it's a gradient white light. Whatever this was, was pure white light. Light. It was linear white throughout the entire spectrum. And what the camera photographed showed without a doubt, especially at a 20th of a second, which that sequence was filmed, that this object was in an airspace. It was beneath, um, it was in a normal airspace, which an aircraft would be in, and that if it was a meteor, a meteor would have had an impact. It wouldn't come back around and fly out of the frame in the same area that it appeared. So it, it showed, without a doubt, intelligence associated to this object for the fact that it is documented in the same airspace two hours later by two different cameras. And I had two cameras running. A lot of people don't know that. But I got two cameras showing the same thing. Interesting. And, you know, generally, when uh, in the old days anyway... Uh, when there was a UFO sighting, Wilbur, uh, generally the military would end up showing up to the area of that craft. Um, I'm not hearing about the military showing up uh, when these craft are being sighted by thousands of people, these types of objects. Why is the military not showing up anymore? First of all, the data indicated that this object suddenly materialized into Sedona airspace. And on a radar scope, that would look like a blank radar scope, and then all of a sudden there's a blip. Now, if you can explain how that blip suddenly shows up on radar, then you can have an aircraft go and see what that is. But what happens is these things appear, they fly into the airspace, they do what they have to do, and then they disappear through the same technology that they use to appear. And I'm going to say that it's wormhole technology because it enables them to come from their airspace into our space undetected. And, you know, even, even that being the case, the only times they are detectable is when they are indeed manifested into that airspace. And that is the case. We do have the technology to see them when they're here. But when they leave, we lose track, and that's indeed what's happening when they show up in radar, when air traffic controllers have these events take place in their um, control tower. These wormholes uh, that we're speaking about, are, are they all over our planet? Um, I did a lecture with Dr. Edgar Mitchell uh, last year, and he discussed that what he encountered in some cases, what other astronauts encounter would be objects that would not be there one minute, and then one second later there's something there, another second later it's not there, and it's in another position in, in the sky. And they were essentially dealing with the fact that it could possibly be an object that can take multiple positions in multiple dimensions at several, multi, at, how do I say, um, simultaneously. And we're looking at conditions of abstract physics that that are theoretical, but indeed a reality that here we have an object, and the sample I have that I'll talk about would be the U.S. Capitol building in July the 16th in 2002, and I did a three-and-a-half-minute exposure of the formation of green objects above my head. And in the three-and-a-half minutes, it shows this object dematerialize and rematerialize. As it rematerialized, it started vibrating, and you could see these patterns, a, a digital pattern on an analog film sample and a digital pattern would show a series of blocks and, and the blocks in the film sample were in multiple directions and it indicated that whatever this object was was oscillating. As it started oscillating, it opened up a wormhole and it, it generated enough energy to displace its position in our space and go back to its position in its space through what, what what I call a stargate, which generated the self-generated stargate. So we're talking about how these objects are able to enter and exit our airspace through these portals. And these portals exist 
in multiple places on Earth. And, that, and that's how, indeed, when you have uh, documentation of UFOs that appear, how they appear in, in most areas, and they're, if you look at the New Fork reports, these areas are usually higher um, reporting areas for the terms of the a number of uh, appearances of UFOs. So we look at these areas, and you would conclude based on the amount of uh, reports that there would be a possibility that there is a gate there that's allowing these objects to enter into that airspace, and we have to conclude that as a reality. So we're, it's basically we're seeing the physicalities of this before the science can actually support it at this point, which is fine. Um, one thing that you did say, you referred to something as with the green object in uh, Washington, D.C., as self-generating a portal to get back out. Uh, what did you mean by that, that it was self-generating the energy? It, it, it started vibrating, and I had a uh, physicist, uh, I had a friend of mine, Dr. James Lindesay, who's a uh, physicist in theoretical applications, and he looked at the sample, and you know, one of the things that was interesting about what he concluded was that he said, well, what we're looking at is camera shake. Well, and I had to back up and say, and say for a second there, wait a minute, let's look at this realistically, because if it was camera shake, the camera shake would be relative throughout the entire image. So if we have blurring here, you see blurring associated to everything, not just one part of a sample of a photograph. So we ruled out that as a camera shake. What we did notice was the fact that in this three-and-a-half-minute sample, and when I enhanced the film itself, is that whatever this object was, it affected the air around it, and as it moved through space in a dematerialized manner, in, in, when I mean dematerialized, it was invisible as it moved through the airspace and became solid again. But as in it's an invisible state, it affected the air around it and left what we would call, and again, I'll use a Star Trek term, a warp signature, and it left this warp signature in the sky. And I noticed that the warp signature started to fan out in a gradient manner towards this void and in the void I could see there was blackness and what appears to be the tail end of this object as it entered into this wormhole from looking from this side of it in terms of looking from our world into its world as it entered into this wormhole and the, that's what we're looking at in terms of the physical data of the actual photograph itself but unfortunately in those days, I didn't have the technology which enabled me to take multiple frames, hundreds of frames and, or video of, of those events. And now, with the camera technology that I do have, I was able to document those green objects last month in airspace above my home and flying towards the U.S. Capitol building. So we have the documentation from 2002 and the documentation from last month that substantiate that those green objects are indeed still here in Washington airspace. It'll be interesting to see, you know, what's next because um, you are filming this nightly, and uh, we there are a few uh, few people that uh, we also know here at the Truth Tonight that are also filming on a nightly basis now. Some craft, some very interesting stuff in the sky. I'd like you to comment, and if you don't have a comment about this, this is okay. Uh, there are some uh, theories about why chemtrails are out there. Do you have any thoughts on that as far as uh, cloaking these craft? Well, first of all, when we look at chemtrails, what, was, what happened is when they manufactured JP jet fuel, they added an additive to it because the last thing you want to see when a jet takes off is its exhaust in dark black smoke and plumes like that. So they added this, this chemical additive to the fuel to generate what looks like cloud matter for its contrail and it, it diffuses into cloud matter and looks like cloud so when people see these airplanes and commercial aircraft and mili military aircraft in flight it's pleasing to look at it doesn't look disturbing to see like if you see a clunker car and it's got problems with its gaskets its seals and it's leaking oil and its exhaust is putting out this black smoke from the exhaust i know you've been behind cars like that on the freeway it's not like that when you see that in, in flight with an aircraft because you'll notice that contrail coming out of the aircraft is pure white like the cloud. So it's a material that they associated to the fuel 
that generates this material that looks like cloud matter. But they can also use it as a smoke screen. And in some cases, when you see a lot of air traffic up there and they're generating this contrail in a, um, like in a pattern um, that would be almost like a checkerboard manner, that basically what they're trying to do is diffuse uh, the sky so you don't see what's happening above the contrail. And it's a smoke screen, basically. We're looking at a smoke screen. Interesting. And, you know, uh, just to verify what you just said, it's interesting because a lot of people are starting to think that as well. Um, on top of, I came across a, a document that actually talked about what you're talking about, and they were deciding what color could be used for the jet contrail. And the colors they chose were blue, there was blue, and then there was another one I don't remember, it doesn't matter, but the blue and the white are the ones that caught me. And they decided to go with white because it was more aesthetically pleasing. Blue would have uh, looked kind of strange to most people. They would have, they would have noticed that they were going to try to blend the contrail with the sky. So I, I just think that's interesting that you just brought that up. I, I never knew that you uh, felt that way about that. But so with that well, in I, mind, I come, it also... I come from an Air Force family. So, you know, I mean, in the right. Air Force, you deal with aircraft. My father was a flight engineer. He was also in military intelligence. You know, I mean, I see aircraft. And he, he, he um, exposed mm-hmm. us to that, my brother and I, to aircraft. And, you know, I mean, I look at it in a, in a more realistic manner. And in, in fact, they did indeed add the additive to the fuel to make it more aesthetically pleasing to the eye because the last thing a person wants to see is this black, black smoke coming from the back of a commercial aircraft polluting the sky. So with the white diffusing matter that's associated to the fuel, it makes it look like cloud matter and it blends in with the cloud. But in reality, we're looking at pollution generated from aircraft. Right, a, I agree. Smoke screen. I agree. I don't screen. care what color it is. No matter and what color it is, screen. it's a smoke screen. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Thanks for that comment. I, I never knew you felt like that about it. Uh, you know, we've got a couple more minutes. So I want to talk about what's the most important thing that's on your, you know, your calendar right now. What's next? What's next for Wilbur Allen? Um, I got a couple of things going right now. Um, my material is about to be featured on Boris FX Motion Pictures Special Effects website, and uh, one of the things I did was in 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 all of the photograph examples that I have of of extraordinary UFOs, was generate and sample the colors from those UFOs, and in generating the colors from those UFOs, I created a color texture application for 3D special effects and and uh, 3D game development. Um, for those people who do game development and the colors that I generated are way beyond industrial light and magic because of the fact that here I've got actual sampled alien objects that I've sampled these colors from and I generated a RG- RGB CMY gradient which means red, green, blue, cyan, magenta and black gradients associated to those and created this color palette for 3D motion picture special effects. And I think now with all of the space films that comes out, that come out on the market, that it would be logical to paint these objects with actual UFO colors, and that's what I'm marketing right now to the motion picture industry and for those people who make uh, 3D games for those people who like to play games. I think that's brilliant, and I can't wait to see what you're going to uh, come up with. You know, I'm, Just, I, I don't know if you have by memory, by the way, a photo that I'm looking at on your website, again, ufodc.com. I'm looking at um, something that appears to be a light streaking across a roof, Um, and it says POV2 anomaly may or may not be the same object, and it's 72210 Dr. Bruce Maccabee analysis. Yes. Do you recall this photo that's on here? Yes, I do. What what is that? Because it's like a, it's a, it's a, like a, a necklace of dots it's, that are it's, going... It's, it's a series... A, again, here's where I was talking about multiple documentation. I had a camera on the platform, and that was a D700 Nikon, and it was taking frame after frame after frame after frame. And it documented this object and other objects which were moving in tandem, small red and blue spheres, and they were in pursuit of what looked like this cloud-like matter that was... It, it had intelligence associated to it because I've got multiple images of other documentation of what looks like a um, spirit floating through the sky and making observations on on certain things, and it it pursued this object, and as it was pursuing this 
cloud-like object. It projected what looked like a plasma beam, but the plasma beam was bending. And here we have a physical sample of a beam of light with a bend associated to it. And that's not a level of technology that we have currently, at least. I, I've been doing some research with plasma balls, and I can see how a plasma beam itself can bend. But I never had seen anything quite like that. And when I sent the sample of Dr. Maccabee, it completely blew him apart. Yeah, I see that. I see why. That's very fascinating. Um, wow. You've got some really cool stuff. I mean, I hope that people uh, can really enjoy what they're seeing. And thanks for the explanations of at least some of these photos. And, of course, all of that is documented at UFODC.com. So when you are looking at a photo, Wilbur has done the you know, the, the work for us. He's given well, us I'm, all not, I'm not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. You know, it's about no. facts here. And, and, and most people that do this, you know, most people, they'll talk about and they'll look at a report and they'll look at some really bad pictures. And these people react to that crap as if it was real. But yet when they look at the real samples, they deny it. They deny the validity of it. And by the way, if you want to look at my UFO colors, just Google UFO colors. It'll take you directly to my alien color textures for those who want to do uh, – games or motion picture special effects but you know it's all about the data and even with the samples that you're talking about with this object and the plasma beam i sampled that so i have this pure white light and pure white color that i have that i integrated into my motion picture effects and all of that's going to be featured on boris effects motion picture special effects site excellent i look forward to seeing all of that and um Definitely seeing uh, the, the, the designs when they're done. You know, any of the games, you know, that you've been a part of, that'll be very interesting. But most of all, I'm going to look forward to having some of these, like Bruce McAbee, and let's get let's get a hold of Macaulay, and uh, let's let's do Jim a Delatoso show and all uh, again exactly. in the future. Exactly. Yeah, let's and exactly. Jim Delatoso, Jim's exactly. a great guy. Let's Absolutely. let's get these guys on on another show, and let's let's have you know the conversation. Uh, Absolutely. With, with, you know, I, I really appreciate that. I, I, I'm intrigued by your work, Wilbur, and uh, I'm intrigued by this, uh, these, these ships that are over Washington, D.C. Thank you, Wilbur Allen, for joining us this evening. You're Thanks listening for to Tonight.com. You betcha. Have a great weekend, everybody. Remember my pet peeve, don't drink and don't drive. And if you do, I'll slap you. Anyway, have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you next week. That, that, ETs are here. You know, you've got James Gilliland doing a documentary. You've got Jose Escamilla doing an, another documentary. You've got Art Bell coming back, EA, to the airways over there at XM, all right, uh, to talk about UFOs. He does not feel that the reporting that's going on at Coast to Coast is accurate. He, he feels like there's, a, there's a, a brick in the road there. He wants to bring back... Uh, the real conversations about UFOs, so something is definitely uh, going on. Now, um, I'm getting some messages. Hold on just a moment. Um, I'm cutting in and out every couple of seconds. Uh, producer is black online, was frozen up from travesty, jacking it around. I don't know what that means. I guess they're talking about Steve Travesty. Are we good now, gentlemen? Can you uh, tell you're me? you're blacking out, uh, blanking out every couple or uh, a couple of seconds. Every, every minute, other you sentence wanna, you blank right. out. Yeah. So you you might want to drop and reconnect. All right, I'm going to drop the call and and can you can you drop it and reconnect me, Thomas? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, how are we doing now? Am I still cutting out? Well, you'll have to talk a minute or two before we know. Okay, so I don't know what anybody heard. Do I need to repeat everything? No, ma'am. It came all through. It was just it. Had, Buff for a couple of seconds. Should okay. be fine now. Okay, should be fine. Sorry to the listeners. And you see, every time I do a show like this, you all know, um, I don't know, we've got people fooling around in the background, hacking, whatever they're doing. So let's just hope that we can stay on the line. Stay with me, you listeners. Chat room, uh, any questions that you have for the show, please uh, chime in. Uh, again, my guest this evening... I find him to be rolling. We are cooking with gasoline tonight. I'll tell you that much. Wilbur, what's going on in the world of UFOs? Uh, it's going very interestingly because on a nightly basis I'm getting objects that are not consistent with anything I'm sure we have in the air in terms of aircraft. Um, 
Uh, I mentioned to you earlier, I, I live seven blocks from the White House, and the White House's opinion is that there is no extraterrestrial activity taking place, but that is indeed the case. Okay, hold on just a moment. Uh, Will, I just heard your last four words. Producer says we're not doing good. Uh, Thomas, can you hop on the air and tell us what we need to do? Because I uh, I don't know if the audience is hearing any of this. Yeah, well, or you're you're the one cutting out. He's not. Uh, okay, I, and I, I can't hear. Is, Will, I can't yeah, hear Wilbur. What I can do is go ahead and cut cut the whole call and restart the whole call. Let's go ahead. By, let's second. do this by telephone, actually. Do, but we're still going to have to go to the Skype server. Oh shit! Okay. Well, it's yeah. it's not it's on your end, Roxy. Whatever it is. Uh, well, and and this doesn't happen where I'm cutting out every two seconds. There's nothing nothing on my end I can fix. I can call you. You want to call me on the phone? I can. Why don't we do that? All right. Let me get your number. All right, folks, we're trying to take care of this. Sorry about this. This you know, y'all know how this happens sometimes with Skype, and uh, sometimes Roxy's uh, Skype does this. So we will have her back in just a minute. Hello. Is this Roxy? It is. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, Wilbur, can you hear me? I can hear you. That's great. Okay, and if we need to dump you off a of Skype and get you on a phone, we'll do that too. Not I don't know what here. the audience has heard. Wilbur, let's just let's start a go. If they didn't hear all the rest of what we were talking about, we'll just introduce that topic later on. But Wilbur, um, you know, I find you to be a very credible person. I've spent many hours on the phone with you uh, several times. And, of course, I gave the statistics on, um, you know, just some of the UFO sightings that are being, those are just the ones being reported. Um, they had a cover-up story here in Arizona a few days ago. I saw the craft. I took pictures of the craft. It was huge. And the news came out with a debunking story immediately to say that it was just a weather balloon. So I personally, Wilbur, do not believe that at this point the government's going to be able to keep a lid on UFO activity as well as ETs are, have arrived long ago. So what's your take on that with your experience, especially uh, during 2012? You had some really crazy experiences associated with filming some, I believe they are wormholes. Uh, I, I would have to say that would be an, uh, an accurate description of that, which I documented in Area 51, Groom Lake, uh, while filming for Big Redneck Vacation, which is a country music television program. And what's interesting is that um, while I was in the desert, I was with a few people. Some of those people are on the air, uh, Iran McCauley and Riley Martin, which are with the Howard Stern Show. And they were with me when I was out in the desert. And when I, when I came back, they noticed that I was a completely different person. That's because in the desert, what I photographed communicated with me telepathically, and it told me to leave. So quite naturally, it was unnerving, to say the least, to look at the photographs that I got and to, to know that, this object had uh, instructed me to leave, and, and it's now following me, and it's imaged over my house nightly. And you mentioned that on, a, on another interview that we did with you. Can you explain that a little bit more uh, in detail as to why you feel um, these cra this craft or whatever it is um, followed you back to D.C. Now, give everybody a little feel for where you live in proximity uh, to the White House, et cetera, and some of the documentation that you've supplied the White House as well. I, I live seven blocks from the White House, and in, in reality, I'm in White House airspace. And the White House's opinion is that there is no extraterrestrial activity and no, no actual documentation of extraterrestrial visitations to Earth. And, you know, they're adamant about that information and detail. And the fact of the matter is, in reality, that on a nightly basis, seven blocks from the White House, I'm getting airborne activity that's consistent with the anomalies that I photographed in Groom Lake during the, the filming of Big Redneck Vacation. 
are just unbelievable. There's even a report Russia prepares for a close encounter. They even uh, supply the PDF file to read through this from the Kremlin. Um, Reagan uh, to Gorb- Gorbachev, uh, the threat from ETs would unite Earth. There's a whole documentation on this. What is going on is what I want to know. And of course, the latest is the Stevensville Lights, a comprehensive radar and witness report study. The PDF is also located on their front page. It just goes Goes on and on, and the truth denied. You know, we are getting hammered by guests who are in this field who need a place to go to talk about the latest information. And and let me tell you something: it's ongoing. There are quite a few people that have been on my show in the last couple, two, three months. Daily, daily activity in the skies. This has gone from you know a sighting a year for most people, or a couple sightings, to just massive massive sightings. We're going to ask my guest this evening, uh, who is Wilbur Allen. He's been on the show before. He's an engineer inventor and is no stranger to the UFO encounters. An alien encounter in the UK at the uh, the age of five left Wilbur face-to-face with a group of gray ETs and a contract photographer at National Geographic. He's a UFO researcher and he will be Entering and leaving our atmosphere through a wormhole or a stargate. Recent footage he shot shows a sudden manifestation in Sedona, Arizona airspace. And by the way, he had a lot of witnesses with him. And we're going to talk about who those witnesses were. Uh, in, 2000, in the 2002 incident, a through see an arc or a hole open up in the sky, followed by a flash of light as he detailed it. I've been getting reports from Mark McCandlish, uh, Jim Kerr, Sean Gotro, and everybody's getting this on film, people. You know, with the ability uh, to have the technology that we do today, and Will has the technology. He's going to explain it to us this evening. We're going to, uh, this is crazy stuff. I want you to know also, I've been asked at least in the last three months to be on about 40, to appear on about 40 different radio shows, some of them AM radio, some of them FM, because of the amount of information that we've been able to put together because of all the guests and the interviews that we've been doing with them. And I want to uh, definitely, uh, Voice Independence uh, contacted me several times out of Seattle. I've been telling people no right now because as you well know, I've been very very busy, but I'm going to have to start saying yes. I'm going to have to start showing up. I'll tell you why. Because this thing is manifesting and it, 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 it is so huge. It is so big, along with the chemtrail issues. See, these are two huge topics for conversation right now that connects everything in the world. Everything in the world. The, the, the suppression of information, the dissemination of, of information, the why we human beings are fighting with one another, our own evolution. I spoke with Wilbur a couple times at length prior to the show, and I don't think the government can keep a lid on UFOs anymore. I'll tell you that much. I just don't think it's possible. Not with over uh, – just shipped out in the first quarter, the first quarter of 2013, over 417 million iPhones with cameras. Sorry, there's just, there's just too much evidence out there to support. Right. And how do you feel about that? I mean, what's your response to that? Do you really think, Wilbur, that the White House doesn't have a clue of the nightly activity over um, their skies and your uh, skies, which you know, is right I can't down the street? That. Or do you think they're covering it up? I think I think there's there's it's got to be it's got to be a, a level of information that's that's being concealed here because just by the fact that um, I'm able to. From a standard position, which is, like I said, seven blocks from the White House, and I'm shooting 90 degrees straight up into the sky, which means I'm shooting straight up to see what exactly happens above the airspace in my home. And on a nightly basis, I'm getting consistent objects. And objects that, uh, again, if you, if you go to my website, ufodc.com, and you go to Area 51, which is at the bottom of the page, and please excuse me if it takes a minute to load because there's a lot of information there. But starting from Area 51 uh, to Sedona to Shreveport and to D.C., which is uh, 10 months of, of information, it's all consistently the same. How do I right. explain images from Area 51, images from Sedona, Arizona, images from Shreveport, Louisiana, 
and images from Washington, D.C., which are all 100% the same on a nightly basis. And there's no coincidence in that. Absolutely not. And, you know, it's all about physical documentation here, and I'm using the kind of technology that enables me to absolutely document those conditions, even in absolute darkness. And the D4 Nikon has the ability to photograph in absolute darkness, which generates essentially what's called full-color night vision. And I'm generating these samples, and then the samples which I'm filming at a shutter speed, for example, of 1 20th of a second, 1 30th of a second, 1 40th of a second, all the way up to 1 160th of a second at night, and getting objects which are uh, inconsistent with um, what one would perceive as this conventional aircraft, you know, one tends to question the um, credibility of those which put the information out there, especially in the White House, to say that this activity does not exist. And, and who would you believe? The samples that I get seven blocks from the White House or what the White House says? Right. And I, I uh, by the way, thanks for mentioning your website uh, with all the commotion. I, I'd like everybody who's listening to the show to go to www.ufodc.com. And I want you to take a look at what we're talking about here because we're referencing some information and we want you to be able to look at it. And I hope we don't crash the sites because, um, Wilbur, you were on uh, one of my favorite hosts, uh, uh Wells, <laughs> I love Johnny B. Wells, and uh, B., he did Johnny a fabulous B. interview. What's that? Yeah, Johnny B. Yay! Um, but uh, Johnny did such a great interview with you. Um, really got a lot of information uh, out to the public in all the right ways, I must say. So kudos to him. Um, but it 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 uh, knocked your server off its legs. And uh, not only that, because I've interviewed you a few times, uh, you, it, it, it temporarily disabled my, my website as well. And our traffic was uh, three or four days of just... Revolution Radio proudly presents, live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. Uh, we are live, apparently. We're live? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I guess we're live. I, I didn't even hear an intro. We're having a little bit of di technical difficulties, people. Welcome to the Truth Tonight Talk Radio. I'm your host this evening, Roxy Lopez. And listen, you are going to want to pay attention to everything we're going to talk about on this show this evening. Um, it is phenomenal what is going on. You know, for the past couple, two, three months, I have been getting calls. Uh, UFO sightings, I saw one myself about three nights ago. I have the downloads. I talked about – give you some statistics on how how the whole UFO thing is just coming to this huge uh, transparency. All right. Um, now, I know some of you may be familiar with the National UFO Reporting Center. All right. And um, that's a, a collection of, you know, UFO uh, reports and data of those reports as well as follow up of those reports. And uh, they even have on the front page of their website right now that whenever, and, and I'm quoting them. Whenever we have an unusually heavy influx of reports, our workload is increased to a commensurate degree. Over recent years, we used to consider approximately 300 reports per month to be normal per month, 300. However, over the last 15 months, 
we have been receiving up to 1,200 reports per month. During the month, reports. So something is uh, really speeding up. And in the news, I don't know how serious we're supposed to take this, but the 25-year-old singer Rihanna pays a UFO watcher for alien updates. She is convinced that extraterrestrial beings exist and pays a sky scanner in the Mojave Desert, California, to give her information on these sightings. Uh, she started using this man who calls himself self a sky scanner to give her information from Nevada or anything that relates to sightings. And uh, I'll pop some of these links into the chat room uh, for you to look over. Uh, if you go to the MUFON website, same kind of traffic going on right now. Uh, the, the reports that are coming out of MUFON right now 